So my first cake actually didn't turn out too well. And a similar story for the second one. It actually took me around 15 cakes to finally perfect how to make chiffon cake at home. And in today's video, I'll be showing you how to make bakery style chiffon cake and how to avoid the common pitfalls as well as how to make an amazing Russian buttercream to go along with it. Ingredient order is going to be a crucial part of achieving a successful bake, so make sure to follow along closely. In a medium bowl, add in 80 grams of cake flour, I'm using King Arthur, and 56 grams of vegetable oil. Whisk together until all the flour is saturated with the oil. This is a little trick you can use in any cake recipe, and this is going to help inhibit gluten formation when we add in the rest of the liquids. Along with the flour and oil, add in 80 grams of milk, 1.5 teaspoons of vanilla extract, and a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt or about 1.5 grams. Whisk all of the ingredients together until smooth. Up next, we're going to separate four egg yolks. And before adding the egg whites to a main bowl, it's really good idea to isolate each egg white in a separate clean bowl. Because sometimes the egg yolk breaks, and that's exactly what happened to me on this first egg. If even a small bit of egg yolk gets mixed in with the egg whites, they're going to have a hard time whipping up and staying stable. After separating all of the eggs, mix in the egg yolks with the other ingredients and then set the bowl aside. Before we start whipping up the bowl of egg whites, we're going to need some cream of tartare to help stabilize them. You'll only need about a quarter teaspoon for every four egg whites. And if you don't have cream of tartare, then you can also use a teaspoon of lemon juice. Use a hand mixer or the whisk attachment on your stand mixer to whip up the egg whites. Start on a medium speed, and I know it might be tempting to blast this on high speed, but using a slower speed will help create smaller bubbles, and smaller bubbles is going to yield a more stable meringue. When the egg whites are foamy, stop mixing and add in the first third of sugar. In total, we're going to be adding in 90 grams of sugar, but adding the sugar in installments is going to help the egg whites whip up faster and be more stable. After adding in the first third of sugar, resume whisking, and this time you can crank up the speed to medium high. Beat the egg whites until they're solid white, but still don't have much structure. Stop mixing again and add in the second third of sugar. Continue mixing on medium high speed until you have soft and floppy peaks. When you reach the stage, you can add in the remaining amount of sugar. For this last stretch of beating, reduce the mixer speed back to medium. Continue beating the meringue until you have stiff peaks. And if you pull out the beaters, it should be completely firm at the base, but there should still be the slightest amount of movement at the tip of the peak. If the meringue is beaten until the peaks are fully stiff, then the egg whites are actually over beaten. We want to stop before this point because otherwise we have exceeded the egg whites capacity to hold onto air and then the final cake could end up collapsing. The final meringue should be smooth and glossy and when it's finished, add in a third of it to the bowl of cake batter. The purpose of doing this is to help lighten the cake batter that way when we add in the rest of the egg whites, we can retain as much of that air as possible. And there's really no need to be too gentle here, just mix until the cake batter is one uniform color. You can really see just how much of a difference a little bit of egg white has light in the cake batter. Add in the remaining meringue, and then fold it in gently to incorporate it into the cake batter. With folding, you're basically just cutting through the middle of the batter, then scraping the outside of the bowl, and you just keep repeating this until the batter is one uniform color. When the cake batter is finished, it's important that you quickly transfer it to a cake pan and that the oven is already preheated. Because if you let this sit around, it's eventually going to deflate. For the cake pan, your best option is going to be an 8 inch cake pan by 3 inches deep and it also has a removable bottom. You can also split this recipe between two 6 inch cake pans. If you're going to be using a cake pan without a removable bottom, then you're going to want to grease the bottom with a little bit of butter and a touch of flour. 
Shake the flour around to coat the bottom and then shake out any excess. But I highly recommend if you're going to be making chiffon cake that you do invest in a cake pan with a removable bottom. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. Also, I just want to quickly mention that it's crucial that your pan is not non-stick. It's important for the chiffon cake to be able to stick to the sides of the pan in order for it to hold its structure. Another really great option besides these cake pans is going to be using a tube pan, something that you would normally use for angel food cake. When all of the cake batter is in the pan, shimmy it back and forth a little bit and give it a couple light taps on the counter to help level it out and bring any air bubbles to the surface. Then grab a toothpick and start swirling it around starting in the center of the pan, working your way towards the outside. And when you get close to the perimeter of the pan, slow down because you don't want to get any cake batter on the clean aluminum part of the pan, which could end up interrupting the cake's rise. Repeat this two to three times, and this will help remove most of the air bubbles from the cake. Before placing your cake in an oven that's been preheated to 300 Fahrenheit, fill a preheated baking tray that is in the lowest rack position up a third of the way with boiling water. I don't know if this technique has a name, but I'm calling it the indirect water bath method. The purpose of this is to use the steam to help delay the formation of the cake's top crust, which will allow the cake to rise properly. If you don't do this, it's likely that you're going to end up with cakes that have empty bottoms, which happened to me several times, but this indirect water bath was the game changer I needed to get my cakes to bake properly. After 40 minutes, remove the tray of hot water and continue baking the cake for another 20 to 25 minutes. At the 40 minute mark, the cake is nearly fully risen to the top of the pan. The top crust is also starting to take on some color, and you might see a couple small cracks, which is normal. And after additional 25 minutes of baking, the top crust is a beautiful golden brown. And if you look closely, you can actually see that the cake has slightly decreased in height compared to what it looked like at the 40 minute mark. And this is a great indication that the cake is done baking. This might seem counterintuitive, but immediately after removing your cake from the oven, drop it on the rack or counter a couple times to remove any excess steam. Then flip your cake upside down onto a rack to cool completely. Cooling the cake upside down will take advantage of gravity to help maintain its height. Allow the cake to cool for 90 minutes or until it reaches room temperature before flipping it back over. After the cake has cooled completely, use a thin knife or a small offset spatula to release the cake from the sides of the pan. Then what I like to do is chill the cake in the fridge for a couple hours before removing the bottom. And after the cake has chilled, it should be relatively easy to push it out from the bottom of the pan. Use the offset spatula again to release the bottom of the cake. Work your way around slowly, pressing firmly as possible against the cake pan. And once you've made it all the way around, the cake should easily detach itself from the bottom of the pan. Now the cake is already amazing as is. But I think since chiffon is not as sweet or rich as other cakes, it's a great opportunity to pair it with a Russian buttercream. Russian buttercream is a great hybrid between the labor-intensive French buttercream and the overly sweet American buttercream. To get started, whip a pound or four sticks of softened and unsaltened butter on medium speed, slowly working your way up to medium high. And after five minutes of whipping, we can see just how much lighter the butter has gotten. It kind of resembles shaving cream, and its wider appearance is an indication of air. If we compare this to non-whipped butter on the top, we can see a stark contrast in the color. To flavor the buttercream, we're going to start with 2 teaspoons of vanilla extract and 4 grams of fine salt. And the thing that makes Russian buttercream special compared to the other buttercreams is that it uses condensed milk. Start by adding a third of a 14 ounce can of condensed milk and then run the mixer on medium speed. When the first batch of condensed milk is mixed in, add in the second third, and when that is mixed in, add in the remaining of the can of condensed milk. 
When all of the condensed milk has been emulsified into the buttercream, add in 110 grams of powdered sugar. Run the mixer until the buttercream is light in texture. When finished mixing, give the buttercream a taste and adjust the salt as needed. My buttercream needed an extra pinch of salt to help balance all of the sweetness. Using the whisk attachment has introduced a lot of big air pockets, but a couple folds with a silicone spatula will make it silky smooth and ready to use. To prep the cake for the buttercream, we're just going to slice it in half horizontally using a serrated knife. Use a sawing motion and try your best to cut it even, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Put down a layer of buttercream on the bottom half that's about a quarter of an inch thick. An offset spatula will make it easy to spread out an even layer. After reassembling the cake, place it in the fridge to chill for a minimum of four hours or ideally overnight. So that way the buttercream can stiffen up and the cake can reach its full flavor. I know that most cakes taste better cold, but that's especially true for chiffon. The biggest culprit for a chiffon cake collapsing heavily in the center is going to be underbaking. Even a couple minutes underdone will make a huge difference. And if your cake seems to be done around the perimeter but still slightly underdone in the center, then I would recommend reducing your oven temperature slightly so that way the whole cake could bake at a more even rate. Chiffon cake is probably one of the trickiest cakes you can make at home. And look, for me it took 15 tries, but hopefully with this video, you can get it done right on the first or second try. Chiffon cake is probably, for me, is the best cake out there. It's super delicious, light and fluffy, and still moist. And there's just so many different things you can do with it. You can flavor it with lemon zest, you can use ube extract, or you can even use coffee infused oil. And really, one of the best parts about chiffon cake is that there isn't so many calories per slice because it's mostly air. But, you know, it's so delicious, you can easily eat half of it by yourself. So there's that. But anyways, I hope you learned something from this video. And if you give this recipe a try, make sure to let me know what you think. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.